Okay, I'm in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to be in verses 26, 27, 28. Probably work my way all the way down to verse 31. And, uh, and this, is a, this is a little bit of a tough passage for a lot of people. Uh, I've been uh, talking with people about the Lord for a long time. And, uh, and I have found that this passage is probably the most popular for a person who turns away from the faith, or at least they turn away from the faith that they understand. And what I mean by that is that, uh, is that when, I, when I ask them about them turning away from the faith, what it usually sounds like is that they, 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 they have a poor understanding of the gospel. They have a really poor understanding of the new covenant, if, if they really understand the gospel at all. And they are turning away from what they believe is the faith, but it, it really is they're turning away from something that, that they should turn away from, which is a, a, a complete misunderstanding of what the Lord has done for us. And so in that sense, it can be a legitimate turning away. But they will abandon the uh, abandon the scriptures and the Lord entirely, which is not 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 the right uh, uh, decision at all. But these passages tend to be the most common ones used, and and it's not out of insincerity. Uh, it, it it really is about uh, the, the fact that that they feel a sense of hopelessness, that they feel that they that they're in a situation where they're not going to be saved anyway, and so. Why not? Just just let the whole subject go entirely. And it's not as though they may become, uh, you know, they, be, they, they become contentious or, or they want to say bad things about God. It's, it's not really about that at all. It's just that they, they don't think that they can, they can make it anyway. And, uh, and so let me read through this, and I'll show you where this comes from. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26, it says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. You know, and and so if you sin willfully, then you have nothing to look forward to but the fiery indignation of hell. That's it's effectively what it says. And what happens is, is that a person will will recognize that, you know, if they're going to be honest, they're going to recognize that the sins that they commit are willful and they keep doing those things or not doing those things, however they want to define their sin. And, and they, they get to a point where they think, you know, I'm definitely violating this. I received the truth as I understood it. And I'm continuing to sin willfully, you know. I, I think that there there just isn't anything really for me to look forward to, but the fiery indignation of hell. And there are people who teach this, who will look at these passages and they will say, "Well, that's what it says." And so if you commit sin, then then you're you're toast. That's it. There's 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 no hope for you. Or they'll try to lighten this up a little bit and say, "Well." willful sin and, and maybe continual sin, you know, to the sense that you just, you do it too much. So if you do it every once in a while, then it's not such a big deal. It's not necessarily what he's referring to. That's how some people will try to soften it up a little bit and to say that you still have some sense of hope, uh, you know, even though it does say this. Other people, they'll just read past it and just keep reading, you know, because they don't have a good explanation for it. And that works for them. You know, that's what they do and it works for them. So there, you know, there you go. It's a it's a solution. Uh, but, you know, the, the real issue is, is, is your understanding is your understanding of sin. And you also have to take these these verses. You have to take this passage uh, in the context of everything else that the writer has had to say. And he's already had a lot to say about this subject. And if you take the position that, uh, that this has to do with the regular sins of life, and, and then you come to the conclusion that you're, you're not going to stop it, and it's obviously clearly willful, then your conclusion is going to be inconsistent with everything else that he's had to say. All right. So, you know, what do you, what do, you do with this? Well, the answer is found in the definition of, 
of the sin that he is referring to. It, it has to do with everything else that he's had to say so far, especially in chapter 10, right here, within close proximity. And that if you sin willfully, you have to define better, well, what is the willful sin? And it turns out that it has to do with unbelief. It has to do with the rejection of what Jesus did for you. It has to do with the rejection of the complete forgiveness of sins. That if you're not going to believe that the sin issue came to an end, well, then what are you going to believe about how sin is going to be resolved? If you won't believe that what he did resolved the sin issue, well, then there, there is no other way that he is going to resolve the sin issue. There is no other way. Either you accept the complete forgiveness of sins or you don't. And if you don't, well, you know, you're going to sin willfully. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? He's not going to do anything more. And so what are there is nothing you're going to be able to do. You have nothing to look forward to but the fiery indignation of hell. That's that's all you've got left. And so the willful sin that he's referring to has to do with the sin of rejecting the complete forgiveness of sins. Now, this is a big topic. It's a, it's a big topic, right? And the reason why it's such a big topic is because people won't believe the truth. That, that's, that's the problem. They're, you're, they're not willing to embrace the truth that the sin issue is over. All right now, this finds itself, this topic finds itself in, in many different ways. In, in, in the previous messages that I've presented so far in Hebrews, I've spent a lot of time talking about how other congregations and other teachers, other people address the subject of sin and how much they just try so hard to keep it alive. You know, they do. They try so hard to keep it alive. And, and it's, it's, it's not going to stop. There, there will always be an abundance of people trying to keep the topic of sin alive. It's just not going to stop. You're going to have to accept the truth, recognizing that just by default, you're going to be in the minority. That's just the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be until the Lord comes and, and ends this conflict completely. The root issue that um, that this really deals with, though, the, the real root issue here is that it's a poor understanding of the gospel, you know, because the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus is all about salvation and it's all about being made into a new creation. It's all about escaping the fiery indignation of hell. It's about having the security of being a child of God and having a place with your God in the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. That, that's what it's about. The gospel is about that. And so if a person has a, has a struggle with this, if, if there is a struggle with regards to this wondering uh, if they're, they're going to be saved or not, then the real, the, the real topic that needs to be addressed, the subject that we have to spend time on, is the subject of the gospel. And... and and it's important. How is it that, that we usually, you know, how is it that you, we usually deal with this? We have to ask the question, what is the gospel? And I've asked this question of a lot of people, and I encourage you to ask this question of people as well. Not with the tone that you expect them to give you the precise answer that, that, that you want. You know, you need to ask people this kind of a question, giving them the freedom of answering it however that they would like, that you're not necessarily criticizing or evaluating them, but you're genuinely wanting to understand what they believe and why they believe it. The most common answer that I have received concerning what is the gospel is that Jesus died for your sins so that when you die, you'll go to heaven, you know, because you'll be able to say that he died for your sins. And, and, and the usual presentation is that he died for our sins, past, present, and future. However, what eventually happens is that there are many other things that people teach or believe that will give a person the indication that, he's, that God still 
holds their sins against them, usually the present and the future sense, but God still holds their sins against them. And then those quickly become past. But what happens is, is that if, if God still holds their sins against them, then there will be uncertainty as to whether or not a person will have a place in the kingdom of heaven. That's how it usually works out. And, and, and until this issue is settled, if, if it's ever settled at all, a person will live with this uncertainty. And Hebrews chapter, chapter 10, verses 26, 27, and 28 will always remain on a person's mind, unless they just skip it and ignore it. It will remain in a state of uncertainty for them such that they may they may really struggle with this and I and I've known a lot of people who do live with this kind of uncertainty and they struggle and they just continue to live with the uncertainty and the struggle until the day that they go and they see the Lord and I can just imagine what that kind of conversation would look like where they would go to God and they would they would say with with great sincerity they would say God I, you know, I am a sinner and, and I have failed and I am evil and I'm just asking you, will you please forgive me and will you please give me your mercy so that I can be with you for eternity? You know, and, and, and I can just imagine that God might, might very well say something that sounds like this. Finally, this is the last time that I have to hear you ask me for this. This is the last time, finally, I don't have to hear about this anymore. I died for all your sins a long time ago. I ended the sin issue a long time ago. I don't want to remember your sins anymore. And you have spent the overwhelming majority of your life trying to get me to remember your sins. Remember your sins and, to, you know, to, to ask me for forgiveness again and again and again and again. Finally, this is the last time I have to hear about this. We are going to rest on the truth that when that when I died on the cross for you, for the sins of the world, that is when it was over. We're done with this. Here's your place in my kingdom. Please just go there and be at rest. Take some time off. And, and come see me when you're, when you're over this, finally. When, when you're done with this and you're not going to remind me about your sins anymore. I don't need to hear about it anymore. I'm done with that. I've got other things to do with my life. And I think you've got other things to do with yours. You know, the conversation could, could very well sound something like that. I wouldn't be too surprised if that was the case. All right. <clears throat> it, it has to, the issue has to do with the gospel. Let's start there. All right. The gospel, the good news, is the solution to a problem. And I'm not going to give you a full presentation of the gospel. I've done that in many other programs and in many other messages that I've presented on this subject. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. If you want to, you can go to the Living God Ministries radio archive. And there's a program titled right there in the middle of the archive, the beginning of section two, What is the Gospel? Uh, you can also go to the programs I did on forgiveness. And, and the first two programs are devoted just to this question in and of itself. I'm just going to summarize that the gospel is a is, is the good news as it relates to some bad news. It is the solution to a specific definitive problem. This problem started in the Garden of Eden when God gave the law to Adam and Eve and he told them there's a tree here that's just for me. You're not to eat from this tree. And the day that you eat from this tree, you're dead. All right? You will surely die. And they did. They ate from that tree and they died. They did not die physically. It was a spiritual death that occurred. When God created Adam and Eve, he breathed within them the breath of life, which is a unique construction of words for the Holy Spirit of God that was breathed within them. They became spiritually alive. They violated the law. The wages of sin is death. Violation of the law is sin. The wages of sin is death. They died, and that was defined as the absence of life. It was the absence of the life of God. The Holy Spirit of God departed from within them, and they became spiritually dead. 
That was the problem. That was the bad news. The solution to this requires two parts. The first part is that there needs to be a resolution for sin. And the second part, there needs to be a restoration of the life that was lost. All right. So first you have to resolve sin and then you restore the life that was lost. If you restore the life that was lost before you deal with the issue of sin, well, then as soon as a person sins again, according to the law of sin and death, they're going to die again. And then what are you going to do? You don't, you don't really solve the problem. So you have to do both of them and you have to do both of them in order. This is what the Messiah accomplished. The Messiah died for the sins of the entire world so that he could restore the Holy Spirit to those who would be willing to receive him. And through the restoration of the Holy Spirit, they have the restoration of the life of God. They are then made spiritually alive. Once they have been made spiritually alive through the restoration of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus died for all sin, there is no sin that will cause that life to depart from you ever again. Therefore, by definition, the life that you have is now an eternal life, an everlasting life. All right, that's, that's the, the general summary. I have turned to uh, Romans chapter 5 just briefly. Romans chapter 5 talks about this uh, a, a, a lot. In Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While you were still a sinner, he resolved the issue of sin. Uh, in verse 9, Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. All right? You've been justified by his blood in the sense that the sin issue was resolved. Much more, you shall be saved. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's by his life you are saved. You're not saved by his death. His death is what made salvation possible. What, may, what, what saves you is the restoration of life. It's becoming alive. It's being made alive. And this life will never depart because the because the, the entire sin issue has been resolved. This topic is all over the scriptures. I'm just referring to just this one, just to give you an introduction to things. And, uh, and in Romans, Paul did spend some time talking about the life and death issue as it related to Adam, and just as sin and death entered in through him, so also forgiveness and the restoration of life comes through the Lord Jesus. This is found in many different places in the scriptures. So if you understand the nature of the gospel from that point of view, then you'll know that the sin issue has to come to an end. And if it has not been resolved, all right, if the sin issue has not been resolved, well, then, of course, it's easy to embrace Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, right? But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. All right, it's easy to understand if we sin willfully because we either embrace the complete forgiveness of sins or eventually in some way, to some capacity, we're going to end up here with that kind of interpretation, but if you recognize that the sin has to do with the sin of rejecting the complete forgiveness of sins, all right? It's the sin of rejecting forgiveness. If you reject his forgiveness, then there's nothing else to look forward to. How are you going to obtain? You're not going to obtain forgiveness in any other way. Now, if a person believes this, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're lost. I do believe that the Lord can the Lord can accommodate a basic fundamental understanding of the gospel, and and I'm and I'm thankful that He makes all these final decisions. I certainly don't, but I have to stay true to to the details. I have to stay true to to the definition of the gospel. That's my part. His part is to make the right decision concerning who will be saved. 
a person can very well be confused and still saved. I, I can relate to that. I can understand that a lot. I wouldn't have any problem with that at all. I certainly will not complain to God if he decides to save someone who's just simply a little confused. All right. But that's uh, but that's what it has to do with. It has to do with a complete uh, w- with a rejection, a misunderstanding. It's a rejection of the forgiveness that you really already have. And that there's nothing else that he can do with that. Now, the writer to the Hebrews spoke about these kinds of things previously, that once you've been saved, you know, there, there's nothing there's nothing you can do about that. You are now saved. There is no sin. There, there is nothing you can do in order to to put yourself into a situation where where God has to send you to hell. That's that's not going to be possible. He introduced this in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, has to do with emphasizing the point that once a person has been saved, they can't be resaved. You can't bring them back to the point of, of, of being saved again because they... Because they've all they've already been there. That's not going to be possible. Hebrews chapter six, beginning in verse four, it says, and 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 uh, I'm sorry, I was in verse three. Verse four: For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away. To renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. You can't you can't go back to that because you're asking him to forgive you again when he already has, and he's not gonna that's not gonna work. Right? He's not gonna go through all that he did in order to provide for forgiveness again. All right, so if you blow it today or tomorrow. He's not going to come and die for you again. He already did that. And what he did was enough, right? It's impossible if you fall away to renew you again to repentance, to to salvation. It's not possible because that's what it would take in order to accomplish it. So if you fall away in some respect due to your unbelief, you're just going to have to acknowledge that you had some time of being confused. Right. That's it. That's the best you can do. You're not going to be able to ask him for forgiveness because your request for forgiveness, your apology, your repentance is just not going to be good enough unless you want to reduce the seriousness of sin and say it's not so bad. You know, the sin after you got saved is not so bad. You can just you can just say you're sorry. You can apologize. You can ask him for forgiveness. You can confess things like that's what people are doing through a misunderstanding of a number of verses in the scriptures. People will do that, but that's look that depreciates the seriousness of sin. It is impossible to renew you again to repentance, to salvation, if you've already been saved, because that would require, it would require the Jesus to come and die again. Look, once you get your harvest, that's what you get. If you continue to read in verse 7 and 8, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, right after this, he uses the example of the harvest, that once you get your harvest, that's what you get. And so if you get somebody who's saved, that's what you get. You you don't undo that. In verse 7, For the earth, which drinks in the rain and off, that often comes upon it, and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. That's, the, that's what this example is about. Verses 7 and 8, it is the example of once you get your harvest, you either get the herbs you're after or you get, or you get the weeds. And then it's over. You, know, you don't go back. There is no going back. What you get is what you get. I spoke about this in the message I did on Hebrews chapter 6 in these passages, and so I'm just reminding you of these. Uh, you, have, you, you have the recordings you can go back and look at to, to, uh, to study that a little bit more. All right, so in Hebrews chapter 10, in Hebrews chapter 10, it's all about forgiveness. Let's go back to verse 1 and walk our way forward a little bit 
work our way forward. And you can see that, that each passage is a buildup to verses 26 through 28. There, it's all a buildup all the way through. Beginning in verse 1, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Right? The law could never make anyone perfect. The sacrifices which they offered continually never resolved the issue. It never, it never resolved the issue. It was never over. Right? So there, there had to be another way. There has to be another covenant. It's all about the fact that, look, this does not resolve sin. There has to be another way to resolve sin. And that's what Jesus did. That's what he did. Verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. Now, that does not mean a denial of reality. No more consciousness of sins does not mean that, that I deny the reality of sin and the presence of sin and that I commit sin. It just means that you, have, you no longer have a consciousness of sins as it relates to your relationship with your God. Between you and him, it's over. Now, he could very well be, 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 be uh, uh, recognizing them as something that represents the need to change and the need for him to work with you, the need for you to mature and grow. Those are ways of measuring such things. And we don't need to live in the denial of reality in order to be successful concerning those kinds of issues at all. All right. The consciousness has to do with the condemnation that we would anticipate. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. All right. In the Old Covenant, in the law, there is a reminder of sins. It keeps sin alive. The law keeps the sin alive. The Old Covenant keeps the sin alive, a continual reminder. And when so many people in the church, we have an abundance of them, so many people in the church are continually reminding people that their sins are held against them. It's the same thing, all right? It is a continual reminder of sin. Do you not see that there is a need for this to end, all right? We need this to end. And if you're not going to believe that God ended this, then what else do you expect him to do? What else can he do? If you're not going to embrace the sin issue being over, then you have nothing you have nothing to look forward to but the fiery indignation of hell. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Verse 4 is not possible. Well, if they could never take away sins, then Sins are never going to be taken away. That's what the Lord Jesus did. Through his blood, sins were taken away. It's over. It, it, it ended. He brought an end to the entire issue. But instead of, instead of uh, bulls and goats, people are now turning to confession and apology. In general, that's, that's what people have been doing ever since. Well, we, we don't want to sacrifice animals because that would be too obvious that we are rejecting the blood of Christ. So let's just say we're sorry. That's not as obvious that we are rejecting the blood of Christ. All right, that's, that's effectively what that means. Verse 5, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Right? He did, he, he, he did not really desire the sacrifices, the offerings. He wanted the sin issue to come to an end. The sacrifices and the offerings kept it alive, kept it going, kept reminding him and you, everyone, 
it memorialized sin. It made it, it, made it permanent in a sense. It, it, it codified it. It established it. it. It made it such that there was no way that it would ever, ever be resolved. All right. Therefore, he came into the world saying, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. I have come to do your will. And what was his will? His will was the previous chapter, chapter 9. His will was to die for the sins of the world so that the new covenant could be put into effect and you could receive an inheritance as a child of God because of his death. And part of that inheritance is the complete forgiveness of sins. He did not desire the sacrifices and offerings, but he did put them in place for a number of purposes. Those purposes have been accomplished. But what he really wanted to do was resolve the issue of sin so that he could restore the Holy Spirit, the spirit of life back within a person who would be willing to receive the complete forgiveness of sins and receive the Holy Spirit to be born again, to be made into a new creation, a child of God, to receive the inheritance in Christ so that we can now live in the new life that we can now live in in accordance with the new covenant through which we can draw near to God. Verse 8, previously saying, sacrifices and burnt offerings and uh, and offerings for sin you did, not, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. Takes away the, How did he take away the first, the first will, or the first covenant? He took it away by fulfilling it. It had certain demands. Either you totally obey, or you die. You're not going to totally obey. And you know, even if you died, it still wouldn't fix anything. So he died. It was his life that was worth giving. And that is how he fulfilled the will, the covenant. The covenant had certain demands, and he fulfilled those demands. First, for himself, through his own obedience to the commandments, and second, through his death, because of your lack of obedience to the commandments. He fulfilled the first so that he could establish the second. He established the second by providing for forgiveness. That's what establishes the second. That's the foundation for the second. In the verse 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And I spoke in a previous message about sanctification. I'm just wanting to emphasize the issue that this was done once for all. Once for all. But if you're not going to believe that, then that's sin. You are rejecting God, his truth, and you are rejecting the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And if you're going to reject that, that's verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, all right, that's the sin. You have received the knowledge of the truth, and if you reject that, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. That's what you get. So let's go back to verse 11. Again, more emphasis on the complete forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, And every, pe every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. There's a good comparison. In the Old Covenant, in the law, the priest is continually trying to help people to resolve sins. With the Lord Jesus... He sat down. He sat down. It's over. There's nothing more for him to do. 
Will you believe that? Will you embrace that? Continuing into verse 13. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Just waiting. There's nothing left to do. Just wait until those who reject him have the complete fulfillment of their rejection. Verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And I spoke about this again in the previous message. In verse 15, but the Holy Spirit also uh, also witnesses to us that after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Right? So again, that's the truth. That's the truth. There no longer remains an offering for sin. You cannot offer anything for your sin. That's the truth. Are you going to are you going to reject that? That is a willful sin to reject that truth. It is a willful sin to reject the truth that the sin issue is over. Again, in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, this this bodies washed with pure water. I should have spoken about this in the previous message. It's not water baptism. It's 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 an expression that describes the fulfillment of the ritual washings that are found in the law. All right, we, but but the but the main issue here has to do with let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. You're not going to be able to draw near unless you acknowledge the sin issue came to an end. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so and so much more as you see the day approaching. All right, so verses 23 to 25 are kind of like a little pause. It says, look, be at peace, right? Be at peace and, 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 and assemble with others who are of like mind so that love can be increased and so that you can participate in the works of God together, right? This is something that you can do. But if you're not going to receive the knowledge of the truth, again, verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. And as a comparison, consider what happened under the law. Verse 28, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant, by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. All right, so there it is, verse 29. Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. That is the knowledge of the truth that people are rejecting, as is described in verse 26. Verse 29 emphasizes what is expressed in verse 26 that that, the people are counting the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified all right they were already sanctified by the blood of the covenant they were set apart 
by that. When they were forgiven, they embraced the forgiveness of sins. They were saved through the restoration of the Holy Spirit. It's a package deal, all right? That's, that's what they had, and they, can, they, they counted it as a common thing, and they insulted the Spirit of grace, all right? God is gracious. He is being gracious, and he says, I give you forgiveness, and people insult him over that. I forgive you, is what, he would, is what he says. And then people say, no, you didn't. That's an insult. God said, I forgave you. I, I ended the issue of sin. And then people respond with, oh, God, will you please forgive me? That's an insult. All right? That's an insult to the spirit of grace. You want to really insult him? He says, he says to you, I forgave you of all of your sins. And then you reply with, I understand. How about if I offer you a, a cow or a goat? Let's sacrifice. We'll make an altar. We'll sacrifice it and we'll set it on fire. Will that be good enough for you? That's an insult. All right. It is a total insult to the spirit of grace. Verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, especially when you consider how loving he is, how gracious he is, and you consider all that he has done. What else would you expect him to do? It, for those of you who, who don't believe that the sin issue is over and you just want to keep it alive, what do you expect him to do to end it? Is there anything that he can do to convince you that it's over? Or is there anything more that he can do to maybe end it? All right, out of, out of all that he has already done, all right, the blood of the Son of God, you know, the, the blood of the covenant, after all that he went through, after all that he did, and you're saying that that, that, doesn't, that doesn't end the topic of sin. It doesn't end it. What more would you really expect him to do? And, and if you can find something that you would expect him to do, he may not feel the same way. He may feel, he probably would feel that what he did was more than enough, was perfectly adequate. So yes, it is, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God when you consider, it's, it's fearful to, to fall into the hands of the living God when you consider all that he has done and you still reject the knowledge of the truth after all that he's done and you still reject the knowledge of the truth concerning forgiveness then it should be a fearful thing to fall into the hands of that particular god after all that after all that he's been through and after all that he's worked through and after all that he's done it would it should be fearful to fall into the hands of the living god all right, that's, uh, that's where I'm going to stop here in this particular message. I have a question for you folks who are in some small groups that you can work with. In what ways do you fail to believe the sin issue is over? All right, in what ways do you still fail to believe that the sin issue is over? Uh, what do you hope to achieve by your unbelief? You know, if, if you don't recognize that the sin issue is over in, in some aspect of your beliefs. If you don't recognize that, what do you hope to achieve? I'll tell you what, what most people hope to achieve and answer that question, how they usually deal with that. They usually hope to feel guilty enough or ashamed enough that maybe they'll stop sinning. That, that's the most common thing, but it's an open question. You know, it's an open question. What are you still hanging on to? And if there is, then what do you hope to achieve? And if you, if you don't have an answer to that for that question, then give some examples of, of what you have found other people uh, are, 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 are holding on to and what they, what they think they're going to achieve by that. And, and, uh, and, 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 and you want to say that in a way not to be critical or condemning, but just to have an understanding that this is a struggle that people are working through. Okay, thank you.